What we are competing for is attention. People have a certain amount of time every day to go spend. Every minute that you're holding someone's attention online becomes more valuable every single day. 2023, 2024, we're gonna look back and be like, those were the years that people made hundreds of millions of dollars selling coaching, info products. What would you recommend for somebody who's a new entrepreneur? They wanna create products around their expertise. Make more content organically. I mean, 300 grand per month per person times 10, you're talking $3 million a month net profit from 10 clients. All right, today we've got a marketing genius with me. This guy has managed over probably half a billion dollars of ad spend. He was just telling me he's had $5 billion of click to cart. That's a new one I've never heard, you know, but I'm, I'm new in the digital marketing game, so I'm just learning all this stuff. I got the man, the myth, the legend, Eddie Maloof. What's up, man? What's up, man? Thank you for having me on the podcast. Much appreciated. How are you managing so much money at so young? What are you, 29, you said? 29, yeah. I, uh, I actually started uh, when I was uh, 19. Just like in the marketing game. Dude, when I when I first ran my first ad, there wasn't a single YouTube video. There wasn't a single article. There was nothing existed online. W were they Facebook ads or what were they? Yeah, okay. it was Facebook ads. It was called Dark Post at the time. Gary Vee kind of like threw it in one of his speeches one time. And I was like, you know, let me look into this thing. It took me 14 hours to make one ad. A Dark Post? A Dark Post. That's what it was called back then. It was a power editor. This is a whole other terminology that like no one who runs ads nowadays knows. But it took me 14 hours of like straight clicking buttons to launch one ad. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So who, who were you running the ads for? Um, at the time I was doing it for my family's businesses. So it wasn't anything crazy, a few grand a month. Uh, and then that just led into people knowing that I was pretty good at ads. I did some uh, like online Forex courses and stuff like that. That was probably the biggest spend we we're spending. Uh, like I was telling you earlier, uh, probably like a hundred grand a day was our biggest point on that one account, 30 grand a day on average. Uh, we ended up getting clients like Burger King, uh, VTech. You have kids, so I don't know if you've noticed most of the toys are VTech toys. Okay. Uh, I did all VTech's ads. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And now I've gotten more into coaching, consulting, info products, e commerce brands. Got it. Like that. Yeah. So it's funny because I had um, Neil Patel on the podcast, if you know him. Yeah. And he was saying something similar. He started when he was super young and been managing massive brands ad spend is crazy like hearing his numbers you know they like manage a billion dollars plus a year that's crazy in ads and so it's like this whole new ball game of just the marketing side that um i've never experienced because truthfully you know i built my career on just like organic marketing and now we're like really diving into the paid side and there's so many nuances to it so you know you you've grown your company over the years from just managing your parents' stuff to now managing all these different brands. What what have you learned along the way? What are the biggest things you're seeing from companies? Uh, from a marketing standpoint, uh, content is everything. Like right now, that's the game. Uh, if there's anything, like one lesson I'd have to put, which is like honestly what surprised me the most about you is like from an outside perspective, not having talked to you too much prior to this, uh, you would think that you're like, really good at marketing, really good at the ad space in general, like figuring out how to crack digital marketing and just even a testament to what I'm saying about content. Just the fact that you've built this insane operation, anyone that's been here, you know, really, really impressive stuff, uh, all from organic content. Uh, that's the thing that I've learned the most. Like these brands that I tell you about, ClickFunnels, Snow Teeth Winding, these big digital brands that we work with, the most money they invest with us is all on content. They want to make the nicest stuff. They want to make the stuff that stands out the most from everyone, the stuff that gets the most attention. Uh, and at the end of the day, like that weeds out a lot of the lazy people or the people that just don't have money to kind of play that game. So when you say content though, with these guys, like it's one thing to make content as a personal brand, but for take teeth whitening, like what kind of content are they making? Do they just have their own teeth whitening Instagram and that's what they're doing? Um, yeah. So for, for snow specifically, they, uh, I mean, most of our content's all product based stuff. So like yeah. our team, like shout out to them. Honestly, we have like animators, uh, that are insane. We basically take the product shots themselves and then animate them on a computer to make them seem like they're alive. They're doing different things. They're flipping, they're spinning, you know, product features on there. Click funnels. I'm sure you've seen their yep. ads, but, uh, a lot of times it's more storytelling stuff. So, uh, uh, I can't, I guess, talk about the concepts that we're doing right now, but it's all very clever visual stuff involving people, not necessarily talking about the product itself, but it's like 
kind of like Geico and stuff, how do we get the message across through people through like a comical skit rather than the product? I, I guess what I'm getting at is there, when you say content though, you're building good ad creative, not yeah. necessarily like this hour long podcast or a 15 minute YouTube video. You're talking about the, the content behind the ad. Yep, 100%. Okay, got it. Because before what were they, they're just posting a picture and getting clicks. That's it. Yeah. And now, I mean, at the end of the day, now it's so hard to scale attention because there's a million Ryan Pineda's running around online, right. posting content, everyone's competing for the same attention. So for you to actually spend paid money and scale it, you need to have that content that is meant for an ad to get that attention, you know, yeah. very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's funny you say this because, you know, talking about click funnels, I, Retired from baseball in 2017. I went to my first business conference in 2018 and it was Grant Cardone's 10 X conference here in Vegas. And that was the first time I ever spent money on coaching programs or anything. Wow. Right. And so the first product I bought was Russell Brunson's at that event. And it was like a legendary performance. He did like 3 million bucks in like an hour or something crazy. And it was so good. I was a guy who was cheap and frugal. I was like, I'm gonna buy that. I don't even know what I'm <laughs> buying. I don't know what this click funnels thing is. I don't even have a product, but he was like making me believe I could create a product. And I was like, I'm in. And then like an hour later, I bought Ty Lopez's product right after. Cause I was already in buying mode. I bought that Ty Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you get to go to his mansion and stuff. I didn't even go, but it was cool. Anyways. Um, Short story, fast forward um, with Russell's thing, even though I never used ClickFunnels, I you know, got a ticket to Funnel Hacking Live. And this was also in 2018. So I flew to Orlando, I go to Funnel Hacking Live, and you know, I meet all these digital marketers. I didn't know that's what they were called at the time. I'm just like, oh, these guys are cool, you know, whatever. And Russell, I'll never forget it. I mean, this is in 2018, right? We're in 2023 now. So this was almost five years ago. And he goes, hey, the game is not, you know, like, you know, we're competing for money or anything. What we are competing for is attention. And he's like, every app on your phone, think of it like, you know, how the TVs used to just have channels, right? He's like, you know, the podcasts are like the news. Instagram is like a reality TV show. YouTube is like a sitcom. And he's like started to make these metaphors. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense. And he's like... You know, Netflix isn't competing with TV. Netflix is competing with everything. They're competing with Facebook. You know, there was no TikTok then, but the, the attention is the game. Like people have a certain amount of time every day to go spend on just mindlessly scrolling or doing whatever they do. And how good is your stuff to get them to watch your stuff? Yeah, I'll tell you this. Look, I was um, I always use this metaphor and... Here's how I look at attention because I'm on the same exact page as you. So like, let's say an average person has four hours a day to waste on things that require attention, like social media, Netflix, you know, just like visually watching things and consuming them. Uh, and every single day, more creators like yourself, people all over the world are basically making more content every single day and competing for that same attention. So mm -hmm. in reality, you know, just supply and demand here, if the four hours is stagnant and that never changes and they will never have more, they probably will only have less. And the amount of content being made is exponential, right? Every minute that you're holding someone's attention online becomes more valuable every single day, essentially, because that time is never changing. Everyone's always limited to four hours. Like mm. you said, it's Netflix, it's the news, it's Instagram on their phone. It's a million things. And for someone to even spend an hour watching one of your podcasts, that is an insane amount of ROI on attention, considering that they only have four for the entire day to spend. Right, right. That's if they're spending all four watching attention. Shout out to all of you guys. It means a lot. Big time. Yeah. yeah. A, lot of, a lot of time <laughs> goes into watching yeah. these. Yeah. No, if you're on this, leave a comment on YouTube. Let us know that you're one of the people, because it means a lot for sure. So, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, attention is the most valuable currency, right? Um, so I, I just always think about that back then, five years ago, when Russell was saying it, and nobody believed it. Everybody was just like, the, the, the social media wasn't what it was today, yeah. back then. You know, his, his whole thing with selling click funnels was like, yeah, freaking anybody could start a product, and, you know, this is how you do it, and here's the perfect funnel. And I was like, okay. And then I tried to create a product that year. And I, you know, I made my very first course in 2018 and I wrote a book. So like he, he definitely influenced me to do those things. Cause at the time I was just flipping houses and like making 
you know, I became a millionaire just doing that. And so when I went to the digital space, I'm like, oh, according to Russell, all you do is you just make a course, you put it in a <laughs> funnel, and you just make millions. This is tight. And so I did it. And sure enough, it never sold. And You didn't sell a single one? I, I might have sold one. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I didn't know what I was doing, nor did I care. It's just cool to see, like, in perspective, four years yeah. in time how much has changed in regards to that. Yeah. Like, basically, I tried it, and I was like, this funnel thing doesn't work, and then... I quit. And then 2019, I still didn't really even sell anything. 2020, that was when I got on social media heavily. And it was at that point, I still didn't even have like real funnels or ads yeah. or anything. But I just, you know, was like, oh, well, people will probably buy my stuff now because they see me. Yeah. <laughs> and it just, that's how it worked out. So when, in, in 2019, when you started going hard on your content. 2020. 2020. Yeah. That's when you went like yeah, yeah. all in on YouTube. For mm -hmm. Okay, cool. What was your team looking like in 2020? Like from a media standpoint, like now you got this, you have the live switching here. Like this, yeah. is, this is a very nice podcast setup, by Thank the way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, back then it was me and my wife and that was it. So, <laughs> That's crazy. you know, we were locked up during COVID and at the time I had like 10,000 Instagram followers and that was all I had. I had no YouTube, no TikTok, nothing. And I remember sitting there watching YouTube and I never watch YouTube. Like I don't consume content. So I remember like people on Instagram were like, bro, you should start a YouTube channel. You'd be good at it. And I was like, why? Who, what's the point of starting a YouTube channel? I don't get it. They're like, you could make a lot of money and like help people and stuff. And I was like, okay, who's, who's your favorite YouTuber? And they said, oh, well, we like these guys, you know, like Graham Stephan and meet Kevin and these guys. And I'm like, okay, like, what do they do? Do they just flip a bunch of houses? They own a bunch of real estate. And they're like, well, no, they just make really good videos. And I'm like, so you listen to them about real estate investing, but they don't really do it. And they're like, yeah, but you know, they've got a couple of houses and I'm like sitting there thinking, I just flipped like a hundred houses last year. Like this is like what people watch. And so, you know, those guys are my friends now and granted Kevin's now doing crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, but I was just like, well, if this is like what it is, then yeah, I think I could do YouTube pretty good. So you were shooting what from your house with a camera? Mm -hmm. Your wife was behind the camera, I assume. Like no, she just edited. So wow. I just I set up the camera on my kitchen table and I just went after it. And so, you know, I started filming and uh, it ended up working out. And I, you know, I studied it. So like even guys like Graham and Kevin, they had courses on how to be a YouTuber. And so I bought them because I was like. I may not look up to these guys for real estate investing or any kind of business advice, but they definitely know media. And so I understood after watching both of their courses, why it worked. I understood thumbnails and titles and clickbait and all the things that made their videos successful, how to hold viewer retention. And I was like this, okay, I get it. I understand why you can go viral. It's a very systematic process. So like right before you came, you know, I, I filmed two, two YouTube videos. It took me like an hour. Um, I scripted them in about an hour this morning too. We're filming this is about an hour. I mean, that's pretty much my, that's the biggest ROI on your, on you as Ryan Pineda at the end of the day, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Making content, you know, doing strategic meetings for different businesses and pro that's basically all I do. Um, but yeah, you know, in 2020, I, I took it seriously because I just, thought that it was the future and i always thought back to what i always believed what russell said in 2018 i just couldn't figure out how to do it because i just wasn't like a paid traffic digital marketer guy you know i didn't know how to do ads or webinars or things that he was teaching back then right and i'm just like this stuff is so stupid. Just tell them to buy your stuff. <laughs> and so if you just watch my VSLs, there's no kind of like uh, framing or anything. I'm just yeah. like, just buy my stuff. Like, this is what it is. It's tight. And then people, so they do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, now I've learned, I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I get to talk to guys like Jason Fladlin and, uh, you know, all these guys. And I'm thinking, I understand now <laughs> why you build it the way you build it yeah this uh, jason flatland's a really smart guy actually we're, yeah we're, you you know him well um well i i created my my last two like true webinars based on his format his frameworks yeah he's cool we work together right now i uh i'm running some ads for one of his offers 
that's pretty much all i can say but yeah he's he's a he's a genius when it comes to webinars for sure oh yeah everyone he does just converts i know yeah i had him look it over and he's like yeah it looks good i was like all right and it's it's done good so so 2020 you started making content your wife it's it's funny because my wife's sitting here right now and she was my video editor she's laughing right now full time yeah. until we had a team now we have a team of well, probably like 12 13 editors total but um uh, at the time, it was just her on her MacBook Final Cut Pro. Final Cut. Is uh, my wife's so a Premiere Pro. For my, so this is what happened. You know, I, my wife has been on YouTube for like her whole life, our entire marriage. We're, we're going on year ten. And congrats, thank you. And she just always loved YouTube, and I would always make fun of her because I'm like, "What do you watch?" I was like, "You go to YouTube to learn how to tie a tie and stuff." I don't understand what you're watching. She's like watching these families and these vloggers. And I'm like, is it kind of like, like a TV show? Like people have this stuff? And she's like, yeah, I like watching their stuff. And so anyways, when I told her in 2020, I was like, hey, I'm going to become a YouTuber. She just started busting up laughing <laughs> because she's like, of course you are. I've only told you that forever that you should do that. And I was like, yeah, well, I, I get it now. Um, because actually, I forgot to mention the, the last part of that story was I started watching Graham and Kevin. And then they started talking about how much money they were making on YouTube. And I was like, what? These guys make hundreds of thousands a month just making videos? Like net? This is crazy. So I was like, I'm in. And anyways, I start making the content and she's editing. And then, you know, COVID opens back up. And um, I'm like, all right. So I go and hire uh, a videographer. And then he starts Does your first ever videographer hire? Mm Mm-hmm. After COVID, like after things started opening back up. I had hired this guy, like uh, his name's Sion. He's still with me today. I had hired him maybe about like three months before COVID just to like, because I, I was already in the mindset of like, man, I might start making videos and I think it's going to be smart. And so we had done like a couple of videos here or there. But after COVID, I went to him. I was like, yo, we're going serious at this. Like three videos a week on YouTube. You know, I'm going to do all this other stuff. And so, you know, him and I started together and then we started hiring more people, hired a, another editor, hired a producer, hired a podcast guy, hired a TikTok guy, hired, you know, this guy. And, you know, sure enough, I just started building this org chart of the Ryan Pineda team. And like um, now everything is pretty dialed in so that it requires the least amount of me as possible. How many team members total does Ryan Pineda companies have uh over 100 wow yeah that's but, insane but that's that's like all company not just you know content yeah yeah yeah, no, yeah. of course yeah yeah. And yeah everything i assume that's contractors too and or everything but contractors yeah i mean we used to i mean my my brokerage when i had a brokerage we used to have over 200 realtors in the brokerage but i got rid of that so um but yeah i mean that's contractors editors you know yeah big staff. difference between 200 realtors yeah and yeah. actual like yeah no these people staff on are working for me right yeah that's insane dude two years like like i don't know <laughs> yeah, yeah i don't know if you ever applaud yourself but that's that's pretty insane dude thank you dude hey if you're looking to grow your real estate investing business whether you're just getting started trying to get your first deal or you're trying to scale and get to the next level you need to join us at Wealthy Investor. We've got events every single quarter that are absolutely crazy. We've got online coaching programs where we have Zoom calls, a community every single week. We give you everything you need to know to start your business, scripts, processes, SOPs, all of it. It's for you so that you can dominate. So if you wanna learn more about how to join our community and be mentored by me and some of our top coaches and be around other students who are absolutely crushing it, Go to WealthyInvestor.com, apply for a free call with my team. Once again, WealthyInvestor.com, apply for a call today. Let's go back to you, dude. So, you know, the marketing side of things, like your goal is just scaling these offers and different things. Um, so are you always just doing other people's products or do you got your own too? What do you do? Uh, we have our own courses and programs, our own events, uh, things like that. that. That does pretty well. We just had our uh, agency founders event in Nashville. So agency owners like, uh, like myself, basically who have marketing companies, uh, will fly in from all over the world. That's a pretty high ticket event. Um, very high level stuff, usually like six and seven figures a month people in the room. Yeah. That's a product of ours. Uh, we also sell like coaching for marketing, like online people can basically buy and learn to do their stuff for their own. Um, which is mainly like affiliate based. I don't really run any paid traffic. It's all organic. Uh, or like friends decide to promote my offers because they usually do pretty well on their lists. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, it's other people's stuff. Uh, most of the deals we have are profit share based, if not 
yeah, pretty much all of them at this point. Uh, so it just makes more sense. Like even yourself, right? You spend 10 hours a week on content. I would rather, not that that's not a good thing to do, uh, but I would rather take like 10 other people who make a ton of content already and just basically pour fuel on their business and mm -hmm. just be able to make them more profit and take my cut of the profit right. along the way. It's just more scalable for my time because it's leveraging more of my team as opposed to me shooting the content myself. I could mm -hmm. technically like disappear and never shoot another video, yeah. but still generate content or revenue, revenue from other people essentially. 100%. Yeah. So what do you think's like the cap of agency owners? Because I was talking to Neil about this because obviously he's, he's got an agency on a whole different level of, you know, going after big corporations versus influencers. And, you know, I've just kind of like looked at the media side and on one hand I was like, man, should I start my own agency? Because we already do it for ourselves. We're going to build everything in house anyway. You know, people are going to want this. Maybe we'll, we'll be a publishing company for different products and things. And then on the other hand, you know, I started like running the numbers and looking at it and I'm like, all right, well, you know, if you don't own the business and the companies and you just do a typical agency model of, you know, percentage of ad spend and a retainer, I'm just like, man, how much money do you really make from doing this? Yeah. Um, great question, by the way. Most people are definitely capped at like low six figures a month. That's like where I see the market for the most part. That's where people like can break past it. Um, at the end of the day, it's all dependent on what kind of agency business you have. So like, let me give you a perspective. So let's just say I have 10 people, only 10, not hundreds, just 10 clients. And uh, I'm generating them each a uh, million dollars a month in profit from the stuff that we do. And we get 30%, 40% of that, depending on the client. I mean, 300 grand per month per person times 10, you're talking three, $3 million a month net profit um, from 10 clients in a way, you know what I mean? Obviously there's payroll and things like that, but when you're, when you're playing this scale of leverage on the million a month that I'm going to make them, it's not going to cost me anywhere near 300 K of payroll. Uh, but it's more the experience that they're paying for and being able to have those things taken care of. So it all depends on how you structure your deals. I have friends who they run agencies that do 80 million, $90 million a year. Um, but for the most part, like, uh, for example, we're in the low eight figure range, uh, as an agency, um, to the rest of the agency space, besides like, you know, big corporate people, like you're talking about, uh, we are the big people. You guys are killing it. Yeah. We're the big people in the space. And like, we're so anxious cause we feel so small or like, dude, we need to get bigger. We need to make more money. Like, I guess that's my point. Right. So it's like, you know, okay. If you're going to figure out as an agency, how to or, you know, let's just say a business and make a million dollars a month. Right. So if you're the agency, then, you know, like, and even too, you know, most agencies I've talked to are, are making 10%, not 30%. Yeah. And, um, they're getting, and that's on ad spend. Usually that's on ad spend, yeah. not profit. Right. But even like profit, I, you know, there's a lot of them that are doing like 10%, same yeah. deal. Right. Unless you're covering ad spend and other things, then it becomes this different ball game. But even then, you know, the more I've gone through the digital marketing game and the cost of acquisition at scale, I'm like, man, most of these guys are just like at a one-to-one -one of cash collected on ad spend. So like, where's the net margin coming from? Yeah. At scale. Uh, it's, it's all down to like systems and operations at the end of the day. The problem with the agency space is your service is people and it's payroll and it's very, uh, very difficult to grow past people. Cause a lot of people, I, I think you're pretty good at this. Um, a lot of people think just adding more people in solves a problem. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in the agency space is you have this, whole problem of like, oh, we need to be able to handle more clients. Therefore we need more people. And the problem is actually in the system itself of the business. How are the communications operating? What are the SOPs? You know, how do we track KPIs? How do we simplify things as much as possible? And so you're right. Most agencies run at like a 20% margin, 25% margin, uh, which is super low and unhealthy when you have that much payroll. Cause you know, uh, you're sitting on hundreds of thousands a month of payroll. So labor intensive, so labor intensive. And uh, with payroll comes uh, mistakes at the end of the day because it's people based, right? So like, as opposed to like a product, if I just want to scale selling this product to $3 million a month, I mean, yeah. no logistical problems besides like maybe a manufacturer issue, but like, yeah, I'm not having a million things break at the same time. And the real problem with agency space, and I'm sure you as a business owner relate to this heavily, but let's say you pay me to do a good job for you. Right. And I get profit share. 
and I'm like, I want to do it myself. Exactly. There's, <laughs> a, there's a certain point where I make yeah. you pay you me so much, much yeah. that you're like, okay, I want to do it myself. Right. And so it's this, it's always this game that you're playing because it's like, you got to make a lot, but not too much in a way. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like as horrible as it sounds. So like in, in my agreements, uh, we, we only do six months and it's for two reasons. One, so we can make sure like us and the client are actually like on the same page. We're vibing. It's all good. Uh, but two, it's like, before we go long term, let's make sure the numbers check out. We make money, and then we agree to a, usually like a year, two year agreement after that. Once that's agreed upon, I have no limitations. I'm like, make as much money as possible because I've been fired probably the last two years, probably like 20 times because we made too much money, and therefore people were paying <laughs> us hundreds of thousands a month, and they're like, let me bring it in house. But the problem is, they bring it in house, and it's never yeah, it's not the same because we're we're doing it from experience. It's not like it's different when you're trying to manage your own team and come up with your own strategies versus someone else who's like doing this across the board can see it and just know like, I just tweak this one thing and we'll make another hundred grand, you know? So here's been my perspective on this, talking to different people who have publishing companies, which for those who don't know is basically where, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know the best way to say this, but you're like a pimp essentially. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like I'm the guy who knows how to, go sell stuff and uh, manage ads and sales teams and ops and all those things. You're a good influencer who's got an audience and a product and an expert in your field. And instead of you trying to go figure out how to run an info company, you come to me and say, hey, publish me and go do all that stuff for me. Let me just teach and do what I do. And um, that's how a publishing deal works. And, you know, I used to think, I was like, man, you know, uh, that the influencer should be making a lot of money on these deals. And the reality is most of them are not. It's the publishing company that's taking the lion's share of the profit. And I was like, man, why would you do that? And because as a, a the content creator guy, I'm like, I know how much work I put into building my brand and my expertise and everything else. And so I should be properly compensated. And, you know, it is my brand and all those things. But then as I've gotten to the other side of it, and now we do all of our own marketing and sales and everything is in-house with basically almost everything we do. And I have all these people who are like, bro, you know, can you do it for me? Can you give me your, your ad buyers? Can you do this, your sales team and like all this stuff. And then I just realize now that it's actually the opposite. The people who are experts in their field are a dime a dozen. There's lots of real estate guys who are just as good as me, if not better. But knowing the marketing and sales and everything else around it, in my opinion, is much more difficult. And so I'm sure you agree because you're on that side. Dude, that's it. your competitive edge at the end of the day, dude. Like I bet <laughs> there's people who can flip houses and wholesale and do all these logistical processes better than Ryan Pineda. Way better, Way for sure. Better. But like they cannot acquire the attention that Ryan Pineda acquires. And that is your competitive advantage in the marketplace. And it's so, and it's like, it's a much more valuable skill. You? Yeah. It's a skill. And for them to compete with you, they either need years of time to catch up. It's not like they can just like watch a wholesale video for an entire day and learn and become better at you at this, what you're doing or spend f loads of money mm -hmm. trying to outspend you in ads. But then again, what's the point if they're just burning money yeah, yeah. to catch up in attention. So mm -hmm. it's a massive competitive edge, dude. Yeah. Well, and it just made me think like <laughs> back to the agency model of, okay, if I'm going to one day own an agency that runs ads and things for other influencers and things, right? What I've also found is that the agency always blames the sales team. It's this, this battle of it's, well, where the leads suck. No, your sales team sucks. Well, the cape, our cost per lead's good. Yeah, because you're doing trash leads. And it's just like this, always this back and forth. <laughs> and then you have uh, whatever. Everyone always gets unhappy if there's not enough money being made. And then if there is too much money being made, to your point, then everyone's unhappy again. And I'm just like, golly, this is a nightmare. Just like this balancing act of keeping everyone happy. And in my mind, I just came to the conclusion that I have to own the majority of the brand, whether I'm the face or not. And, and then if, if other else, I'm not doing it. That's probably the best way to take it. <laughs> and, and if I were you, I wouldn't work with any brands that require ad spend. Ad spend's the volatility in the model. That, that is the volatility. If you take someone who already has attention and you're clearly good at monetizing the attention, I think that's something you do 
you're the top 0.001% in the world of this, like taking the attention that you have and finding ways to actually monetize it and create products that fit that need and actually turn it into revenue. Cause there's a ton of people that have more views than Ryan Pineda. Dude. Yep. That's percent. Wait, dude. I mean, my brother, dude, he gets every month over a hundred million views every single month. <laughs> What's he do? Uh, he, he, his name's Arab, A R A B. Uh, that's his handle. And he does, uh, like live streaming uh, in the world. So now he's in South Africa doing crazy stuff. He's he just like streams. a lifestyle guy. Yeah. Lifestyle guy, but he turns him into like viral clips. He knows what goes viral. And so like while he's live, he'll do things or have certain interactions that he know he can clip and he'll just get 10 million views. For example, uh, that's, he's definitely like a viral specialist. Uh, but does it make that much money? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So monetizing. so if I were you, I would start an agency with people who have attention that doesn't require you to spend money on ads. Cause that's, where you're cutting deep into the margin at the end of the day. And that's the volatility, right? It's like, like you said, like one month you spend a lot on ads and now you're in the red because sales team didn't close. They're blaming them. It's just yeah, a yeah. big finger pointing sesh. Uh, or you take someone that doesn't require ad spend who has good organic reach, but doesn't have the product. email marketing on the back end, the product, things like that. You take majority stake, you take your 70% of the whole thing. Yep. You monetize it on the back end and you just take their attention and funnel it in. That, If I was you, that's the only agency model I'd be into. Yeah, and that's what I've come to the conclusion of too, of like, I'm definitely not going to be at managing ad spend for people, yeah. you know, and dealing with that crap. It's a headache, dude. That's well, and I think, so it's funny because we're, we're buying businesses this year. So this is like the whole new thing for me. Every business I've started has been from scratch myself. And I've built every funnel. I've unknowingly been like this marketing guy. Uh, I just, it became, it became natural to me to be like, brand is super important. Everything without the aesthetic, the funnel, the, like, I didn't realize what I was doing was like being a direct marketer. But anyways, so I've realized too, that with acquiring businesses, um, you know, I know that like people I've had on the podcast, like Cody Sanchez, she does this, Hormozy does this, the Cardone is now doing this. And, you know, I know Hormozy was, and I'm sure his model is probably going to shift at some point, but he was taking minority stakes in businesses. And I'm just like thinking in my head, you're going to end up doing all the work anyway, because people just cannot execute things you tell them when you know you can do it better. Because I could be like, hey, guys, here's how you film the VSL. Here's how you, you know, do this and that. You know, here's how you hire salespeople. And then they're just not going to do it as good. And you're just like, screw it give me it. Like, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to script the VSL for you. All right, cool. All right, this is done. Let's make the funnel. Boom. Okay, cool. All right. You can't, you don't have salespeople. Let me go just build the sales team for you. It's not worth it unless you have the majority share at the end of the day. Exactly. Well, our Mosey does something different. He, he takes, he takes minority stake on equity, but he also takes forced percentage of revenue Yeah. as, as a monthly payout to kind of make it worth it. Yeah. I acquired two businesses last year, other smaller marketing agencies, essentially to fill needs that we had instead of building new departments. Yeah. Uh, same situation. I did it zero cash down. I took 70% equity. I gave the person who currently owned the business 30%. I just gave them a better salary molded them into our infrastructure. Now they're all for media marketing uh, as opposed to their own agencies. Um, and we basically handle the central admin work. So HR, finances, marketing, things like that. We're the hub. Yep. And then we're essentially distributing deal flow to these people. So like even you, if you have certain holes, like I know you're, you have multiple businesses that fill these holes, but instead of starting a new one, just acquire, grabbing someone up for 80%, you know, yeah. and just funneling them into there, I think. Yeah. Dude, you make so much money off that. So I was talking to, um, I had Tim Sykes on the show. Um, by the time this releases, that one will have released too. And, I had a really good meeting with him and his partner, Zach. And so they have a publishing company now too. And I mean, I can't say on air how much they've done, um, but they've been doing it for 12 years <laughs> and they've been at like, and they've been at the top, they've been at the top of the game a long time. And we had a very good conversation cause uh, I was telling Zach, I was like, Hey, you know, we want to start a, you know, agency because man, it's like, it's easier to control in house, like your media buying, your copy, your, your ads, everything. He was like, bro, don't do it. And I was like, really? <laughs> He's like, yep, we, we just, we outsource all that and it, it just works way better for us. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that. He's like, yep. You know, everything else we keep in house and yeah, we have our own copywriters and things, but like the actual media buying itself and ad creative and stuff, we just keep that outsourced. Very interesting take. Yeah. 
because I see a lot of people doing the opposite direction. I know. And that's why I was like, hey, I want to do the opposite. And now I'm like, I, I see both sides of it. And I'm like, yeah. To own an actual agency in the way I want to own it is not like super anything. Yeah. Because it's just like, honestly, it's not even an agency. It's just a marketing department. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, to fulfill That's my really what it company. ends up being. So, so th this is what I was going to get into. That's the real long-term benefit and ROI on an agency. Like short-term, it's cash flow. Like you can cash flow very well on an agency, and you can probably get acquired by another larger agency later on. But for me, it's the engine that powers all the other companies we have. So, like we started with the agency as one vertical, and now we have you know recruiting companies, uh, education companies. Et cetera, et cetera, as right. we start rolling these out. The agency itself becomes the marketing hub, which really is, as we've talked about, is really the competitive edge, right? Like I can find finance people anywhere. Yeah. I can find people who hire people. And like all these things are standard admin things that aren't very variable based. But the marketing side is the part that like allows you to have the competitive edge on the other people. Uh, and so basically we're using our agency to end up being the engine to create deal flow for all these other companies that we're acquiring or building. So yeah. maybe that's what it is for you at the end of the day. You don't need to take on other clients, but you have your own agency Yeah, for Pineda. Yeah. And if somebody does want us to do stuff, they need to have their own attention and then we need to own the majority of their company. Yeah. I've tried too many times with people who don't have attention. It's too hard. <sighs> it, it used to work probably. It used to, it, dude, it used to be so easy. Now it's just like you're competing for attention and by doing so, you're getting paid a retainer as an agency and you're spending an aggressive amount of their money to be able to compete with the attention that they don't have. Mm. So it's a double-edged sword. They're paying you, they're paying yeah, for I mean, attention. Would you say, because I don't see it too often anymore, but like take a real estate guy, you know, you're going to have to compete against Pace, me, all these guys who have both attention and credibility and everything. Like, can they even compete if they have no attention at this point? Um, they have to have dollars, but even if they have dollars, like, isn't there going to, their cost per everything going to be so much higher? It is short term. I'll tell you, I've scaled real estate offers and, uh, right now we're taking one from zero. It didn't exist. Um, they have a little attention. Don't get me wrong, but like nothing serious, like nothing enough to like make more money past one weekend of like funneling your attention right, to right. a webinar or whatever it is. Uh, and now they're doing six figures a month in net profit, which, you know, for you yeah. might not be much, but for them, uh, bro, I'll take six know, figures in net profit from anything, dude. Done. <laughs> <laughs> if you're like, bro, this will make six figures of net profit this month. I'll be like, how long, how many hours of my time does it take? Oh, one hour. All right, let's do it. Yeah. I'll tell you the ROI won't be as strong as you and paces. That's, well, that's yeah. what it comes down to at the end right. of the day. Like paces ad dollars can go so much further than so many other people's like, just for reference, like I'm not going to say exact numbers, but I'll tell you ROI, like cold traffic, people who have never heard of him, whatever it is, just because of what what he's built on the back end of like uh, attention for himself. We're not we're not piggybacking off his attention, by the way. All our ads are excluding all pace followers. Yeah. yeah. And email lists. Everything. Trying to get it's, new people. It's purely cold on purely cold. Um, very significant spend weekly. Uh, we're getting like a four to six X ROI cold traffic, like mm. cash collected, not like contracts out or all these fake stats that everyone gives. Like you spend a hundred, for example, you make 500. Like it's like that. And it's because of everything else he's built. Whereas someone else is going to get a two X ROI a 2.5 max, maybe yeah. on cold. Um, that's the advantage that you guys have. You can outspend everyone cause your ROI is so much higher. Just cause the back end's already built. Yeah, it's not, it's not even the back end, dude. It, like, we build a whole new back end. It's, it's the attention that you already have and the content that you create. If I get someone through an ad for Ryan Pineda, that person could go down a rabbit hole for five days of Ryan Pineda content between your short form, between yeah. your long form. And by the time they get to whatever it is that I'm selling them, they're sold. Yeah, right. So that that's really the key difference, I think, is like your content allows people to move much faster from cold to warm. So knowing this, you know, as a guy who's seen, been in for 10 years now and have seen, you know, all this, this change that's happening, what would you recommend for somebody who's a new entrepreneur um, getting started, you know, and they, they want to create products around their expertise? What would you recommend? 
Um, one, make more content organically. Like I have dozens of friends who only do organic. They make multiple six figures a month in net profit. They just started selling their own products. Uh, that's the number one way. Don't get into ads. So start there. That's what, exactly what I did, by the way. Yeah. And I mean, dude. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and then uh, number two, uh, I'd say don't uh, expect the outcome to be amazing right out the gate. Like that's like the number one thing, especially if you don't have attention. It's a brand new product you're launching. Like you said, dude, you only sold one of those things yeah. two, three years ago. Yeah. Dude, I have so many cases where we do something for someone like a webinar or some sort. We'll sell one or two the first weekend. They'll be like, oh, my gosh, I'm discouraged. It's never going to work. Then five, then 10, then it's 30, then it's 100, then it's 300 every single weekend. And all of a sudden they're they're making tons of money. But it's just like it's a game of percentage points, you know, like one percentage point every single week on a conversion rate or on a show up rate or on a click through. Whatever those little metrics are, like it's adding up those things over time that get you to the point where you can just clear millions of dollars a month and have some pretty good margins on them. But it all starts with nothing at the end of the day. Mm. I guess that'd be my advice. Like one little micro step at a time. It's it's gonna right. take some time for sure. Everyone just thinks, like you said, they watch a video online, they're like, I could just like <laughs> put something online and just make a ton of money like everyone else. Yeah. Is. You know what I found is like so a lot of my real estate buddies have tried to, you know, make courses and things and like they just can't do it, right? It's a totally different skill set and their real estate business was already doing really well. So it's like, they look at it and they're like, I don't have time for this. Like it's not working out. I'd rather just focus in on more real estate, which is fine. Uh, it's just, it's a different skill, like a way different skill. And both make money, dude. Yeah. And like there's stupid amounts of cash flow in info products and courses. And I mean, the margins are crazy. And that is what's funding a lot of these people's real estate as they grow. They basically just add a new source of eight figures of net profit a year. That's just eventually all going into real estate at the end of the day. So, yeah, uh, I think, I think if you're good at a money making skill set, 2023, 2024 are going to be like, we're going to look back and be like, those were the years that people made hundreds of millions of dollars selling coaching info products, all of it. Cause I think right now we're in a place where everyone is so afraid and they want to find new ways to make money. Even if it's a few grand extra a month, Yeah, that is a game changer for them. And so they're seeking these different side hustles, let's call them, yep. uh, or money making skill sets that weren't taught in school or whatever it is. Uh, and now is a time where people are taking that money that they've saved, whether it was from 2020, all the stocks going up and crypto and everything, uh, or just save from work over time. And they're looking to spend that on things that generate them an ROI. And I'm already seeing returns on courses info products in general over the last like six months, just absolutely booming. And I think now is the time, if you do have a skill set, you're credible like you, you're actually practicing it. I think it's a really good time to build that community and start selling that product. Mm. No, I love that. By the way, guys, if you didn't know, I have a coaching program teaching entrepreneurs how to create content called Wealthy Creator. You can go find out more about it at wealthycreator.io. The mission is help entrepreneurs get views and turn those views into dollars. So yeah, I'm pretty passionate about that because, um, you know, I, I just think every entrepreneur is going to create content. Like you just don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it's not like it used to be five years ago where you could just be a ghost and run your business and be fine. Like if nobody knows who you are, they're looking for somebody in that field and whoever has some content out there is going to get the business. Dude. I mean, just the fact that you have over a hundred employees, you have multiple businesses, and you still say that the highest ROI activity is sitting in front of this camera mm -hmm. and putting out content should be enough for anyone to just shut up, turn on the camera <laughs> just do and, it. and just get to work on yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I think the hard part is this. So, and this is my sympathy. It's not an excuse, but it's the sympathy for both sides. So on one hand, if you're a successful entrepreneur, you know, you're going to go and try to make content. You're going to realize like, man, this is hard. You know, it's a new skill. And you're going to realize I'm spending this money and I'm not making money because you're not going to make money right off the bat. I mean, like it takes time. This is a long-term thing. It's like expecting to make all this money on a rental property day one. It's like, no, the, the point of holding a rental property is not all this amazing cash flow you're going to be getting this month. It's that 10 years down the road, it's going to be worth way more, you know, all these things, right? Everything's going to appreciate rent. You know, you're going to pay it down, all that stuff. So the, successful entrepreneurs have a hard time justifying the return on their time
because it doesn't happen instantly and they're sacrificing time that for sure would go make them money, you know, elsewhere. That's a lot of money. So that's why they have an issue. On the other hand, the people who aren't making money and struggling have the issue because once again, it doesn't make money right away. And so they don't have the money to go in, put towards content. You know, they have time for sure. They can go edit their own videos. They can go put in more work that way, but it's still, once again, hard to get it off the ground. And so when you're trying to figure out how to make it work, it's hard. So I see why both scenarios do that and why very few ever reach. The, the, Which like is not the bad for people like us who are actually trying to make content and having less competition at the end of the day. But I saw a stat. Um, I forgot who sent it to me, but maybe Gary V was talking about it, how the amount of podcasts have gone down significantly. Did you see that? No. Yeah, it was like in 2020 was the year of starting podcast. And so a bunch of people started podcasts in 2020. And now that they look at the statistics in 2023, the amount of podcasts being started is like way lower. The amount of people that post once a week on a podcast. I want to say, don't quote me on this. Somebody correct me in the comments that it was like 150,000 people there's only 150,000 podcasts that post, you know, once a week. That's the competition versus, you know, and then I saw this from somebody else too. Like I, I keep seeing these like things about podcasts, but somebody else posted a video where a guy was like, yeah, well, this is, these are the stats on podcast, but you want to go on Instagram and compete with a billion people. You want to go on TikTok and compete with a billion people versus the podcast game is just right there for the taking there's no competition that's very interesting mm -hmm. at the end of the day you're turning these podcasts into yeah yeah TikTok they're, they're gonna be everything things. anyway and which is why i believe the podcast is like the most powerful tool there is right now in social media not because just you know this is my philosophy this is what we teach our students at wealthy creator you know obviously number one we want to optimize our time as entrepreneurs. We don't have all day to be sitting and making content for 40 hours a week. We got real businesses and other things. We are not content creators first, you know, then figure out a business second. We are business people first who are trying to amplify our business with content. So in order to do that, we have to be efficient. Well, what I always teach is that your short form content is just the gateway drug to your long form, meaning my short form is strictly just all about getting eyeballs and attention and getting people to be aware of who I am and what I do and what I teach. From there, hopefully, they go and realize, oh, this guy Ryan's got a YouTube channel. Let me go watch his 10-minute video on YouTube about whatever, flipping houses, personal brand, marketing. Cool. They go see this 10-minute video. Now they get to understand who I am because through a 30-second clip, they can't really get to know me, right? From there... Maybe they notice I have a podcast and they're like, oh, okay, he's got this hour long podcast. Oh, look, he was just with Liver King or Cardone or Patrick Bedate. Like, this guy's interviewing some big people I follow. Let me go see what, you know, he's all about. And then, boom, they go watch an hour long podcast. At that point, if somebody watches an hour long podcast, they're most likely buying something, right? For somebody, like you said earlier, to spend an hour with you, they're going to go buy something. And, People have to start looking at it like that if they're entrepreneurs and that short form leads to long form. You know, I know this for a fact. We just had an event, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we had over a thousand people at the Mirage. And when I talked to the people at that event, they've paid at least a thousand dollars to be there. They, um, all have told me like, Hey, I loved your podcast with this guy, with that guy. Right. It tells me like the buyers are watching long form on the flip side. I've met many people walking around Vegas who recognize me, but they don't even know my name. <laughs> They're like, dude, I, I know you're that guy on TikTok. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> they don't even know my name. Yeah, They're like, yeah. you're that like real estate guy on TikTok. And so it's like, yeah, they're obviously not buying anything from me, but at least they're aware of me. And maybe in a couple of years, they'll find their path to knowing who I am and what I do. And maybe they'll be interested in year. It'll take years of nurturing. Where um, do you feel like most of your short form is winning right now? Is it on shorts? We post them everywhere. I mean, we post them on shorts, Facebook, Do you Instagram, notice like TikTok. anywhere pulls in more weight for you than, than other sources? Um, I mean, shorts are definitely doing good. Reels are doing good. TikTok is weird right now. So, you know, I'm not really sure what's going on with them. But yeah, I mean, like 
the thing with short form is every platform does it now. So you got to get good at short form. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, but the reason I really love podcasts too, is like what you said earlier. Um, man, actually by the time this launches it, everyone will be able to do it. So <laughs> we started not an agency for ads, but an editing agency. And so it's called wealthy media. Anyone can go to it at wealthymedia.com. And basically we just have editing packages for entrepreneurs. And so you could buy an editing package where you just send us all your videos. We'll edit them for you. Okay. Short form. Um, or if you want to hire us at the next level, one of our coaches will sit with you for three hours and pepper you with questions to get the most out of you for short form. And, you know, we'll take it, we'll edit it, we'll post it, we'll do everything for you. Um, but one thing we're going to launch too is basically like the Pineda package. And so the Pineda package is basically the most efficient form of filming that you can do. Meaning that, hey, you're going to film one podcast a week. It's going to be an hour long, whatever. We are going to cut that into two five to 10 minute YouTubes with a lots of edits and B-rolls and subtitles and everything else that a five to 10 minute video needs. And then we're going to also cut it into seven different short form pieces, you know, under a minute and get you all of these short form pieces. And now basically you took an hour of filming and it gave you your entire week of content. Because when you think about it, you got one podcast, two basically full length YouTube. So that's three YouTube videos a week. Plus you got seven short form, which you can post on shorts, reels, TikTok, Facebook. And so basically you get a reel a day. And so with one hour of work, so like that's the Pineda package. That's the Pineda package. Cause I've been doing that for the last two years and it crushes. You shoot, a, you shoot a podcast every week almost. Well, now I shoot three a week. Wow. Three a week, dude. Yeah. Mad respect. That's I, a lot. I enjoy pot. Well, you know, the, the reason I shoot three a week now is because I get so many requests. Yeah. You know, just people hit me up about whatever right somebody's introducing a friend of a friend and i'm just like all right whatever hop on in it's like how that would you yeah um so yeah podcasts are great like the amount of short form content we'll get from this my my editors if they really now granted i don't need to do like the two five to ten minute clips because i have so many podcasts but if i was only filming one podcast a week i'd totally just be really squeezing everything out yeah of it. if you had to edit them you'd definitely be in a bad situation but this live switch right here is absolutely everything like we we don't have a live switch and we post edit our podcast and dude the bottleneck that that is for the editing process and releasing it it's just like i think after this i'm gonna go back and live switch all our podcasts because i mean i assume you're gonna have this thing ready as soon as we're done talking essentially it's like really yeah the podcast po editing the podcast is easy right well if you're live switching but um you know, the hard part is picking the clips that yeah. that's where the money's at Oh, for like the short form content. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, that's where all the money's at right now. Mm -hmm. That's what you do all this for at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and look, like I said, with the Pineda package, it's for the entrepreneur who doesn't have a lot of time, but they want to get the maximum effect. And that is it. Like if you film one hour long podcast a week, you can have a lot of content yeah. with us anyways. Yeah. It makes sense. But, so I still think everyone should also do direct short form filming. Like I do have a session where you shoot 20 videos, knock it out and be done and do that once a month. You do that once a month. Mm -hmm. Nice. I assume most of them are here in the cycle here, wherever. Yeah. Nice. But so, I'll sit there once a month and go film all my reels for the month and I'm done. So I have a question for you. Okay. You're buying a ton of businesses this yeah. year. That's, yeah. that's your game plan what for and are they mainly businesses that are cohesive with your company or you don't even care you're just trying to roll out more more revenue no yeah so for now they're cohesive um my goal is 12 i already got two so wealthy media is one of them with the show oh, that was an acquisition basically nice um and then what is the other one uh i i don't know if i can announce it yet but so there's another one yeah but once that deal's finalized that's two already and then I'm starting another, a third one that I'm excited about. That's a startup, not an acquisition. But uh, anyways, majority of businesses, I want to already basically connect with what I'm doing. Um, do I need to be the face of all them? No, absolutely not. Ideally, you're not. Honestly. Ideally, I'm not. Right. Unless it's just a big, big opportunity. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, so what we're looking for are companies in the real estate niche. And so lenders, title companies, appraisers, whatever, right? I understand Inspectors, this. Inspectors, I get you. You're I understand this industry, right? And so we can take those companies, scale them with our marketing techniques and everything we do. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other one would be like you guys info. So we know info now and we can go acquire info companies that, you know, need help. Same thing you guys are doing. Third one would be basic. Like, so those two would be cash flow businesses right now. The third one would be our Hail Marys. And so these would be tech and blockchain. So, you know, I've got an NFT project called Tykes that's been highly successful. And, um, like our mission there is to pioneer the future of real estate. And so I've got so many blockchain businesses that reach out to me on a monthly or weekly basis um, because they know what I'm doing in that space and you know really taking stabs at some of these like and granted they're not going to make money right now and they may never make money but man if one out of ten of them hits Hail Mary's dude that's what they're for yeah like they're they're they could be big and you know when I look at utilizing blockchain with transferring real estate and syndications. And even when I look at the future of real estate and how we build homes, 3d printing prefab, there's like a lot of stuff happening that I'm very in tune with that could serve a lot of purposes across the entire ecosystem. If we acquire them, that's insane. And currently not including future acquisitions, how many individual businesses slash products, I guess, do you have under Pineda Co right now? Uh, I mean, it depends how you segment it out, but I always say I have, well, now seven, um, businesses that are seven, eight figures right now that I've all started from scratch. But I mean, you could even segment it out further if we wanted to, um, like you can make Airbnb a separate business, the rental portfolio, you know, um, like there, there's Ryan Pineda, the brand the the influencer and, you know, we're now like turning content into a business like before I never took like I just barely ever did sponsors I barely ever did like paid guest or any of this stuff and now I'm building funnels for that because everybody wants it and um it's like yeah you know it's probably time to stop running this thing at a loss as far as <laughs> <laughs> production goes yeah, yeah and you know start actually paying some bills with the content side so yeah you know we're yeah I want to just build a bunch of different things golf with Ryan you know, that's a product <laughs> that product has done like 300 grand. Oh, actually? Yeah. Golf, no way. Golf with Ryan's actually a product. That is a product. That's crazy. The it's only not, time it's not its you... own business, but it's a product. That's fair. I mean, yeah. to most people, that's a business, dude. 300 well, I like grand to, is I tell people I'm a professional golfer. I've been paid to golf many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> did you, uh, did you beat pace by the way? Or did you lose to pace? I did lose to pace. It was oh. embarrassing. It was absolutely embarrassing. I thought you would win. Honestly, I'm, I'm not going to tell pace that, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I it, thought, I thought you were gonna it, it should just, it was just embarrassing. I'm, I'm just so disappointed in myself and, you know, I, I've been embarrassed quite a few times in my life, but this was one of the most embarrassing ones. Yeah. So, uh, la last question for me to you, um, where, where do you see, uh, the content and the real estate market, both of them going over the next 24 months? Those are two completely separate questions, but I think you probably yeah. have a good pulse on both of them. Real estate market's heating up. I mean, by the time this, this airs probably a month from now, you know, today's, uh, what's today? 24th, 23rd, January 23rd is the day of this filming. Um, we are already seeing the market heat up tremendously in real estate. Um, so February 24th, hopefully I look like a genius and it's already like on fire. So, that's what I predict. I, don't, I mean, I don't predict like on fire like yeah, it was yeah. the last two years, but in comparison to the last nine months, the last though, six months, yeah. it's going to be way hotter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's real estate content. So you don't think there's going to be like no. a massive slump, right? No. Cool. I've been saying that forever. Yeah. Um, which has been the case. I mean, everyone thinks there's this massive crash. It dropped about 10%, and now it's. You know, I don't want to say it's on the upswing, but it's definitely not down anymore. It's yeah. going to be flatter. I don't know about the Vegas market, but in Atlanta, where I'm from, there's like no supply. Yeah. Like you literally can't even buy a house if you tried. Yeah. And basically what's happening now is all these people who were waiting the last six months because they were scared. They want, they're thinking things are going to crash. They've realized like it's not and I need to buy. But now you have all these sellers who are like, dude, I ain't selling. I got a 3% mortgage. There's no point. I, I wouldn't even make money. Why? Why would I sell? Where am I going to move? So there's basically no supply, but the demand is still there. 
Um, so yeah, that's what I think about real estate on the content side, dude, I'm gonna just keep doing what I do. I'm just going to keep pumping out massive amounts of content, try and stay ahead of the trends, predict where things are going. I think content's still at the infancy stage of what it is. You know, if I look at Netflix and Disney and HBO and all these guys, they're in a content race. Like they cannot produce enough content. They are paying billions and billions of dollars to make content. YouTube is the same way. They're trying to pay creators. They're trying to acquire channels. They're trying to, everybody's in the content war because that is what, drives attention. And so those who are good at creating content and getting attention will have all the dollars funneled to them naturally. And so, um, we are by no means like past anything, like it's just getting started. But you're, it sounds like you're also looking to spend more money on ads this year. Oh yeah, for sure. So, you know, like I said, we've been doing ads for like six months now and it's been good. We've learned a ton in six months and um, we're constantly, you know, like I said, I, I built it the, the hard way, but also the lazy way in that I just said, Hey, make organic content, let people just come in evergreen. And that's what happened. You know, ironically though, it's not the lazy way. It's actually the harder working route. It is the, the harder working. I always say I'm lazy when I'm not, but like to me, I, I feel lazy because I know I could have did all the other things people do. But I was just like, eh, this is good enough. And it, cause I knew that that was the foundation. Yeah, I yeah. knew that putting my time and energy only on ads was just chasing the rabbit forever. But I knew putting my time and energy here was building a foundation that could last forever. And then I could add ads later. But so now, now that the foundation is built, I need to now go do the things that normal people do in this space. I need to run challenges. I need to run webinars. I need to, you know, have different <laughs> trip wires and all this crap that everyone does that I don't do. Um, I probably need to not just have a VSL saying, buy my stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> it works for you though. I mean, <laughs> it, it, wor it, it works on a warm audience, but will it work on a cold? Uh, you know, those are the things that yeah. I'm thinking about. I'll tell you someone external who doesn't know you personally. Uh, and hopefully, you know, in the future, we, we end up uh, building a better relationship together. But, uh, dude, it's extremely impressive what you've done in two-year period. Like, from a company structure, from an attention structure, from, dude, not many people can sell a room of 1,000 people. We just we just did our event. We had 150 people in a room who paid 5 to 10K a ticket. And I know how hard it was to put those people in a room. I can't imagine 1,000. Uh, and we do it every quarter. Every quarter? Yeah. Get out, dude. I know. When people, when I, people are like, bro, like that was crazy. I'm like, I know we're about to do it again. Like I'm literally announcing the next one uh, <laughs> today. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. We just are like, I, maybe we're too naive to just, we just do whatever. So it's going to be fun. I love that, man. I hope this year is <laughs> exceeds your goals. I hope you spend more on ads than you thought you were. That's usually a good thing. That means they're working. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, dude, go hard as possible on the info product space this year. I think this is the year that. It's going to pop. You're going to, you're going to cash out big on it and you're going to change a lot of lives at the same time. I appreciate that, bro. Well guys, if you enjoyed this, make sure you go follow Eddie. Also, I did a podcast on marketing and a lot of things we're talking about. So go check that one out. We will link to it, or you can click right here if you're on YouTube and uh, we'll catch you on the next podcast. See you later.